Hello. This is a a workshop called Postcards, which is a workshop about descriptive writing and the ideal that we're looking for, which is to be able to capture the sense of a place with as little writing as you might put on the on the back of a postcard. Really, that's it. Wishing you were here. We're gonna we're going to try to encourage the reader to be able to experience the place we're looking at. So. We're going to um, looking at how you build a house. That's the idea. How you build a house in the mind of the reader. So the first question, which is almost a, a kind of philosophical question, is where is this house? Where is it? So we're going to play a little thought experiment. We're going to imagine there is an old house, okay? And there is a writer who comes along and they see this old house and from seeing it, they then write a description of it. And so they, they write this description and they make a couple of copies. And they give a copy to each of two readers. And the readers read the description and they picture the house in their minds. So now here's the question. Where is the house? Or we could say, actually, we could rephrase that slightly, perhaps to get at a, a deeper truth, and that is this. How many houses are there? Well, we know that there's one house, which is the one that the writer saw. That's real. It's there. It's bricks and mortar. It's something you could go along and touch. It's surely the model and the authoritative version of, of what this house is. But then each of the readers has probably developed a slightly different picture of what this house is in their own minds. One might have imagined the paint on the door being blue. Another might have imagined it being red. So what do we do about this? How do we understand this? Well, in, the, in one way, we could say, well, there is only one house and that's the real one. And these people have faulty understandings of what it is. But that's not really very helpful for us as writers. As, help, as writers, it's much more useful to think about the question of there being one house for each of the readers who reads it. And each version of this house is slightly different. And sure, there's another one, which is the physical one, which may be the original. But none of these houses are any more uh, authoritative than any of the others because they are all a genuinely held experience of a reader. Now, bearing that in mind, we can start to ask the question, well, what is this house made of? How has the reader constructed the house in their own mind? And sure enough, part of that is the text. And that's something that we as writers have provided them with. So we are giving them that. But as well as that, each reader is bringing their memories and experiences along. And those memories and experiences will be of old houses that those readers have come across in their lives. And for some of them, the, the paint on the door may have been blue. And for others, the paint on the door of the house that they saw in real life would have been red. And so without them even thinking about what they're doing, within the mind of the reader, this magical alchemy is going on, which takes all those memories and experiences and combines them with the text that we've provided and goes to create this unique version in their minds. And this is a great thing because we can use this, can use this understanding to power up our writing because we know from having gone through this sort of mental experiment, this thought experiment, that we don't need to provide everything. We only need to provide just enough so that the readers can do the rest. So let's get building. Let's see what ingredients we can put into the text itself. And the first ingredient I'm going to encourage you to put in is to simply tell the reader what it is they're looking at an old house in this case. Now we're sometimes in instructed that we should show not tell. You must have heard that before I'm sure. Show don't tell. 
personally, I think that's a bad piece of advice. We need to show when it's right to show and we need to tell when it's right to tell. And these things, you know, showing and telling achieve different objectives. Telling is incredibly efficient. It gets a lot of information over very quickly in very few words. Showing is very immersive. So we want to combine those two. And so we're going to give our, our reader a help by first of all telling them they're looking at an old house. The next thing we want is to give the reader a generalised visual piece of description or a couple of generalised visual pieces of description. If we're describing the old house, we might say that some of the slates on the roof are missing and some of them are cracked. And we might say that the paintwork on the door is peeling away and is dry and it needs repainting. Now, we're not telling them the colour. We can let them make that up for themselves. We can let them decide for themselves. We don't need to tell that because we know they will fill it in, even though we've not told them. The next thing we want to give them is something non-visual. Now, visual is great, uh, but we need to sprinkle in the other senses as well. We could put in sound and uh, both vision and sound share the, uh, the the characteristic that we can experience them over distance. The other senses, when we get to smell and touch, taste even, these are very intimate senses and th these indicate we're coming very much closer. So you can actually manipulate where the reader imagines this thing to be with respect to themselves by simply choosing the correct sense that will indicate closeness or distance. So let's say for our old house um, that the doorstep is, is um, an old piece of sandstone that's worn down in the middle and when you touch it it is rough and you can feel the sand grains breaking away in, and feel the grittiness between your fingers. So we're giving them a, a sense of touch in this case. And then we are going to go to what is maybe seems insignificant, but it is, in my opinion, the most important ingredient in this list. And that is to give some small, precise visual detail. Now, this is this kind of thing that's so small and precise that were we photographing it, we would need to adjust the camera lens to get the focus just right in order to bring it out in crisp detail. And the thing is that that tricks the mind of the reader into doing just that, into focusing and into imagining that the whole picture is in that same crisp detail. So in the case of this house, let's imagine that there's an old style keyhole in the door and that there is a key actually in the door, it's rusty, and that it has already been partly turned so that it's not vertical, it's off at an angle from the vertical. It's that kind of precise, specific detail that we really need. Um, so that's, um, you know, that is our basic recipe. And, and But having said that there's a recipe, I'm also going to say there are no rules. and uh, But you might like to give it a go. What I want, I suppose, is for you to give the recipe a go treat it once or twice as if it is a set of rules and then throw the rules away because you won't need them anymore because you'll have a feeling for how these techniques work and go together. It's just like baking a cake. The first time you do it, you follow the rules precisely, the recipe. You measure everything out. But then after once or twice you've done it and you get a sense of how it's working and you might just vary your approach to the recipe a little bit after that. So let's go for a couple of examples. Now I'm going to give you some examples from a story that I've written and it's called All the Secret Postcards by Rod Duncan, that's me. And it was a story that was written as part of the High Street Tales project and that was sponsored by Historic England. And in my story we take the life of an old man uh, who is remembering various things from childhood and he is, because he's losing his ability to form new memories, 
his experience of life and his experience of his memories are very fragmentary. And so I had to pay very great attention to the descriptive work in this in this story in order to capture each scene, uh, which may be quite small and discrete and separate scenes, but to capture each one vividly and quickly. So I'm going to share three paragraphs from this story and you can see how I use the formula. So here's the first one and I can see my, my picture slightly covering it up on your screen. I'm going to uh, just alter that so we can, you don't have to have me in the way. Um, hold on a moment. Uh, let's just remove that. There we go. And um, so here's the text. They're standing in a department store. His mother is exploring a display of pale pink cloth patterned with tiny roses. But it might not drape so well, she says, then pulls out the end of another roll, feeling it between thumb and finger. This one is blue. The flowers are white. There is a loose thread hanging from the edge. OK, so let's think about this one. We start off, as I said, by telling the reader what it is they're seeing. They are in a department store. That's telling, not showing. Then we have a piece of fairly generalised visual description. There is his mother. There is a display of pink cloth. And then there is another roll of cloth that she pulls out. These are fairly generalised visual descriptions. I do put in the detail of patterned with tiny roses, but it is a generalised texture. I'm not referring to a specific part of it. Then we get the non-visual element, which in this case is the texture. It's the feeling of rubbing that cloth between finger and thumb. And although I'm not really describing the texture, I'm just showing someone doing this thing, that will usually be enough to evoke in the mind of the reader a sense of what it is like. And then finally, the small precise detail, which is the thread hanging from the edge of the, um, the, edge of the cloth. It's a tiny, precise, single thread. I don't say that many threads are hanging off, that it is just a thread. And that is the precision that we need in this kind of case. So the next example is a little bit later on in the story and here we have the boy waiting for his mother. He is waiting for her near the clock tower, scraping lines in the dirt with the heel of his shoe. A man hurrying past throws down the butt of a cigarette, it sparks as it lands and for a moment he is lost, watching the thread of smoke. So here, again, we first of all tell the reader where they are. This is a story set in the High Street in Leicester, and we see the clock tower, which is an architectural uh, construction there at the end of the High Street. So just telling the readers that that's where we are sets the overall view. So then we have a couple of of sort of senses of visual um, description. He is scraping lines in the dirt with the heel of his shoe. So a generalised sort of visual thing. A man hurrying past is another generalised visual thing. I'm not telling you much about the man. I'm just getting that sense of movement and that sense of a person and the sense of the crowds out on the high street. In this one, I haven't given a piece of non-visual uh, description. And that's because I don't follow this formula exactly each time. In, we might think that there's perhaps the, the indication of the scent of the cigarette, uh, cigarette smoke, but it's not, I've not really, not really put that in, in on this occasion. I didn't feel I needed it. But we do have the precise small detail, and that is the sparking of the cigarette as it lands and the thread of smoke, that the smallness of those things will sharpen the reader's view. That's my hope. And then we go to a, a final example. 
And this is the man, the protagonist in old age. And we have already in the story now established that he's living in um, a nursing home. And, uh, and so there's a certain amount of the work that's already been done. We don't have to redo all this work painting the picture of the home where he lives. He is upset and can't remember why. The daughter is stroking his hand. There is tea with a chocolate biscuit in the saucer. He watches the chocolate melting where it touches the cup. All the crockery in the nursing home is the same pale green. So here, I'm, I'm not doing that initial telling. This is a paragraph that happens later on in the story, and the readers already know that the place he is is some kind of uh, sheltered home. And, uh, and so we don't need to kind of repeat that. It's already there. We have the non-visual part here in the form of the act of the daughter stroking his hand, that ta tactile, intimate sense. We have generalised visual descriptions, that particular institutional green crockery that you'll probably be aware of and probably most readers will be aware of. And then we have the precise visual detail, which is the place where the chocolate biscuit is touching the cup and the chocolate is melting on it. And again, it's there very deliberately. The small, precise detail is there to give that sense of focus and immediacy. That's the intention. So now it's your turn. I'm going to encourage you to go and have a go. And you can start by describing in that recipe of five things the place where you are right now, the room where you are. Maybe you're outdoors. I don't know where it's going to be. But you can have a go at just collecting those five things. Tell us what it is. Give us a couple of generalised visual descriptions. Something non-visual. And then some small, precise detail. And let's see if that conjures the place for your readers when they finally read it. <laughs>